I'd like to talk with you today about bone fracture resistance beyond BMD and T-score. Um, if you go to the doctor today to ask about how strong your bones are, you'll be given a BMD test, a bone mineral density test. This is an x-ray where basically they look to see how white the x-ray is of your bones. In other words, how much bone do you have there? How much mineral is in the path of the x-ray beam? Um, if you have bone loss, which this test can look for, then you be prescribed a drug to reverse bone loss or at least keep it from getting any worse. That's the standard of therapy today and it's prevented hundreds of thousands of fractures. It's not, however, the full story and it's not possible with present drugs to get a 90% reduction in fracture risk or anything like that. The reductions in fracture risk that you can get with this approach of just dealing with bone loss are typically of order 50%. So why is it that you can't completely cure the problem of fragile bones by correcting bone loss. You know from your own experience, in the case of wood, for example, that there's good wood and there's bad wood. There's rotten wood and there's strong wood. There's oak and there's balsa wood. And there's wood that's been eaten by termites and wood that's uh, dry rotted. I mean, there's good wood and bad wood. A scientist would say there's wood with good material properties and poor material properties. And so in this image, for instance, of a person over a chasm, uh, you might want to know about the properties of the beams, whether they're sound or rotten, before you stepped out on them. It's not just the dimensions, how much wood is there, it's also, is it good? Um, this has not been possible to measure for bone until now. But I can convince you that it is important. Let me first just show you a piece of bone that's just taken from uh, a cow femur. This is just a soup bone you can buy in the supermarket. And I've cut it up into little pieces. And I'll show you this piece. Um, if you, bone is pretty strong. You can whamp on it with a hammer and it's not going to break. The, and that's even this piece of bone that's dried out for a while. When it's really nice and wet and moist, it's even more fracture resistant. But say you take it and you bake it and degrade the organic components, like this piece of bone has been baked and the organic components have been degraded. Now this bone would have the same bone mineral density as this bone because we haven't done anything to the mineral. We've just degraded the organic components of the bone. But let's see what happens with these two samples that have the same bone mineral density. You just saw this one, but now look at this one. You think it's going to be harder to break now that it's baked or easier? What do you think? The answer is, it just shatters. The organic components are very important for the strength of the bone, but they're not measured in, in, bone, material and, in bone mineral density. So what could you do to distinguish these two pieces of bone? How could you go beyond bone mineral density and um, measure the bone material properties? It's not really practical to do three-point bending on a patient. So in order to measure these bone material properties, um, what you might first think about is, well, how are material properties measured on other materials? How are material properties measured on the wood? Well, they're done with things like three-point bending in engineering labs, where you put the bone spanning two supports and press on it with the third until it breaks. But of course, this isn't practical to do on a patient. So some other approach. The other approach began with this sledgehammer and those baked bones I talked to you about. The idea being that I could use this sledgehammer to see how easy they were to break depending on how much they were baked. I could lift the sledgehammer to various heights and let it drop and see what it took to break them. And the next graph shows you that if I had the bone unbaked, that would be at 22 degrees C room temperature, I'd have to lift up that sledgehammer to the full height, something over 80 centimeters, and drop it five times to break the bone. At the other extreme, the highest my oven could get, which is about 260 C, um, 
I only had to lift that sledgehammer three centimeters and drop it and the bone fractured. So now I had samples of bone that are easily fractured and less easily fractured. And the beauty of it was I could make them slightly more easily fractured or way more easily fractured. So start out with them quite different and then gradually to refine the instrument, try to get an instrument that could develop ones that were more and more, that could distinguish ones that were more and more the same. And so I thought a lot about how would you do this? So how would you measure how easily that bone is fractured? How would you distinguish? The first success came with an automatic center punch. Now this shows little pieces of baked bone and control bone, that's bone that was not baked, and it shows an automatic center punch operating in a water bath. We do all these measurements under fluid because it does make a difference and it's important to be physiologically relevant. Now what you see on the baked bone, if you look under where the word baked, you can see the indents that were made and you can see that the indents are bigger than the indents on that bone labeled control bone. So this automatic center punch was able to distinguish between the poor material properties of the baked bone and the better material properties of the control bone. The control bone was less indented. Um, but how would you do that in a living patient? I mean, you can't slice, you, in order to see how deep the indents would, you have to slice it open, make a surgical incision and look inside it with some kind of measuring instruments. Not really practical. So what would be a practical way to measure these indentation distances in a living patient? Well, the invention that I came up with was reference point indentation. And I have here the world's first reference point indentation device. It's right here. And the, the idea of this device would was we would have something that would do the indenting. That would be this, this probe. And this one could be like hit with a hammer or something to indent. But then to measure the distance of indentation, we would use this, which had another probe that sat on the bone as a reference point. So, and this gauge would measure how far the indenting probe went into the bone relative to the position of the reference probe on the surface of the bone. So we put these together like this, and then the idea would be this would be set down on the surface of the bone, and there'd be some slight tap here, and you'd see how far it went in. Uh, this instrument was problematic though because a slight tilt on this instrument caused big changes in the reading. Uh, perhaps you can see that on this camera that if the instrument tilts, it changes the reading because the two points are spaced apart. Uh, that would obviously not be good on a patient. And so the next innovation was to instead of using two points like this, to use a hypodermic needle as the reference point. So the hypodermic needle is the reference point that sits on the surface of the bone and then we'll run the indenter down through the center of that. And so this was um, a later version. And in this version you can see you put the thing down on the bone. This one is kind of a working version. You put it down on the bone and then you can lift this and drop a weight and see how much the bone is indented. Let's try this again. You lift it up and you drop it and you can see how far the bone is indented. Um, so when I had this instrument, there was already a physician who thought, let's do a clinical trial on this instrument. Let's see if this instrument can distinguish the bone of people who've had hip fractures from others. I was a little reluctant to do that though because I thought this technology had a bright future and I was worried that this instrument was not capable enough to dis measure everything about the bone that ought to be measured. It was just measuring this one parameter that might be better to have an instrument that would really do a, a lot of measurements while it was in there. And so we worked toward an instrument that would not just measure the indentation distance but could measure a complete force versus distance curve of the indentation. It could plot out exactly what was going on. And the commercial version of that instrument is sitting here. So this is the current version of reference point indentation. This instrument, or a, a prototype for this instrument, 
has been used on patients and was able to distinguish between the bone of patients that were easily fractured and patients that were not easily fractured. And so now it's possible to measure bone material properties relevant to fracture for the first time. Thank you.